Welcome to the Jungus Games Impressions Vlog. As you can see, I'll be covering four games today, and I'll be going through them in alphabetical order. Now, I do want to mention that if you would prefer to listen to this video instead of watch it on YouTube, that you can do so by looking for the John Gets Games podcast wherever you normally listen to podcasts. Now, before we jump into talking about games, I would like to ask that if you enjoy this video, that you please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Also, if you would like to directly support the channel and the creation of future vlogs like this one, then please go to johngetsgames.com support. There you'll find a bunch of ways that you can really help things out, and some of them come with cool perks like voting on a couple of the videos that I film each month. All right, let's now start talking about games, and the first one of these is Castello Mithoni. Now, this one was published by Mandu Games at Essen last year, and the designer of this game is Leo Colavini. Now, he designed a game called Masons that was published back in 2006, so a long time ago, and from what I understand, there are some uh, connections between Masons and Castello Mithoni. Um, now, I don't know much about Masons beyond that it has some slightly different components, and you roll dice in that game, whereas in Castello Mithoni, there is no dice, but there are cards. Now, uh, speaking of that, let's talk a little bit about how the game plays before I discuss my two plays of it. Now, in this game, you are trying to take over territory in the middle of the table, and there is a map with a bunch of triangular uh, regions on it. Now, on your turn, you're going to take a couple of actions, and the main thing that you do is you discard a card from your hand that has terrain on it, and you then put a wall down on the line between two triangles on the map, where one of the two triangles matches the terrain of the card that you just discarded. Now, once you put that wall down, you put a little cube... I think it's a house uh, of your color on one side of the wall in one of the triangles. And then you take a cube from one of your neighboring opponents and you put that down on the other side of the wall. So right from the get go, um, this is actually the reason why I was interested in this game. Uh, I love it when, when you're playing games, the acts that you do and the things that help you out also help out your opponents. Now, in general, your opponents are never going to be sad about having their houses put down onto the map. So that means uh, your opponent could take their turn and put your house down, which actually helps you out. Now, once you uh, place walls down so that they enclose an area, essentially the walls all touch each other, then you have to essentially buy that area. Now, the way this works is you have to spend uh, money to the bank uh, for the terrain, but you also have to give money to each opponent for each one of their houses that they have in that area. So by putting opponent's houses down into spots where you actually want to enclose those spots, you have to pay them money, and every single money in this game is worth one point at the end of the game. So you are giving points to enclose these areas, but the areas are worth points to you at the end of the game, uh, usually more than the money that you are spending. Uh, well, definitely more when you are buying the plots. Now, the game gets really interesting when it comes to completing areas adjacent to previously complete areas. Now, what happens is you complete that area like normal, you pay the bank for the land and the people for their houses, and then you have the chance to annex the adjacent complete area. Now, when you do this, you have to pay just the person who controls that area, who bought that area, and you pay them not only for the land underneath in that spot, but also for every single house and villa in that area, regardless of whose colors those are. So that means if my house is put down into an area that uh, someone to my left is going to enclose up and then somebody else annexes that, then that person who uh, made that area with my house gets paid for my house. You only get paid for your stuff when uh, you actually buy the land from the game and do not annex it from your opponents. Now, I mentioned villas because every time three houses of the same color are within a domain, they turn into a villa. And instead of spending three money for those three houses, you have to spend five money for that villa. So what this means is this is a wacky game of area acquisition and control because you are constantly playing cards out to play walls out to buy areas and annex spots from each other. And you are just throwing money back and forth. Now, one key thing about this game is that there is a closed economy for money. Uh, you uh, deal out all of the money at the start of the game, except for a couple off to the side, and then a few on the board that incentivize people to go to specific spots. Um, now, what that means is, at the start of the game, everybody has some money, but if you do some stuff and then somebody annexes your area and they give you a bunch of money and then maybe that happens again, suddenly you have a ton of money, which means you could annex a gigantic area on the board, but if you do that, then maybe you're spending like 18 uh, money and you're giving that to an opponent, and in my experience, it seems like winning scores in this game are like... 50 or so. So the idea of giving that amount of uh, points to somebody else is really fascinating, although you would only do that if you are obviously going to make more points for holding the area. Now, I'm trying not to go into all of the nitty gritty specifics about how many points this is worth and how much money that costs overall, but I'm sure you can get the idea now that this is a really wacky game. <laughs> and it, what it, uh, the kind of game state that it gives the players is um, a feeling of 
uh, impermanence for sure. It's a very tactical game, but also just some really interesting uh, moments where you're trying to figure out which opponent to help. And then when you're trying to figure out if you want to buy things, you have to decide, is it worth it to you? Now, when you uh, annex a region from an opponent, you don't pay anything to them for the stuff in there that's your color. And this is uh, a really interesting wrinkle because it means if uh, I put some houses out or some of my houses go down and somebody else buys that area and then it gets annexed and whatnot, then my stuff is still in that area. And if somebody else annexes it, then they have to pay the controller for my stuff. But if I try to annex it, I have a discount because I don't pay for my stuff. So that means if somebody is leveraging the fact that one of their opponents has a bunch of their stuff in their area, that's fine until that opponent decides they want to buy that area and it's going to be much more cost effective for them considering they don't have to spend the extra coins and coins are money. Uh, so uh, that's kind of a general idea of how the game plays and uh, some of my feelings on it. Uh, and now I'd like to talk about my two plays. Now this game uh, plays up to five players and I've actually only played it at five players, which is a little bit unusual. Uh, usually when a Euro style game plays up to five, I usually try to play it at three or four instead, but the two opportunities that I've had to play this one had five people. Now um, I'm happy to say that the game seems to work out pretty well at five because I am really enjoying this game after two plays. Now that I have uh, some more nuanced opinions about this that I'll get into uh, in a second, but um, something kind of interesting happened between the two games. In the first game, it was a first play for literally everyone. And um, based off of the people that were in that game, it seems like there was a lot of kind of random decisions happening. I mean, people weren't playing poorly, but they were kind of going for this and going for that and really not uh, focusing in on any specific thing. And the board uh, ended in a really funky way. Like we had uh, walls all over the place, uh, different sized uh, terrain in lots of different areas. Now, uh, out on the map, there are these spots called markets that, again, I don't want to go into the specifics of, but they are good. You want to control these markets. And in that first game, People kind of went after the markets, but not super. They were kind of doing other things, just trying to make big areas. But then in the second play of this game, which again was five players, people were all about those markets. There was so much focus on controlling those markets early in the game, and the markets are on the outside of the map. So what ended up happening is we all went hard to make markets, and then we, of course, grew next to the markets and annexed markets away from each other because it's good to control markets. And then we also kind of built around the outside of the map a lot in that second game. So when the dust settled at the end of that game, the map looked totally different, which was kind of interesting to me. Uh, now, I didn't mention it, but the game ends once all of the walls are uh, removed from the supply at any one point in the game. So it's, it was fascinating to see two five-player games with uh, very different end game states. The middle part of the map at that second game was almost untouched. We just went so hard around the outside, which uh, obviously I think used more of the walls. And there were some really inefficient uh, domains in that second game. So I think that things have gone could have gone slightly differently um, with uh, somebody doing a slightly different thing to cause an annexation to rip a bunch of walls off of the map. Because I didn't mention this, but when you annex, you actually remove all of the walls that are on the inside of that area. So at this point, I am really curious to keep on playing this game. Uh, in general, I don't actually like area area majority acquisition uh, control type of games. Uh, I'm more into, uh, you know, engine building and indirect player conflict. But the way this game uh, makes you feel like you get stuff when it's not your turn, and also if somebody annexes your area away from you, well, sure, they probably are giving you more uh, less points than you just lost for that area. But now you have so much money in front of you that you can look out and annex somebody else's. So there is almost this like um, a hot potato game with a pile of money that kind of happens throughout the game where at the start the money is diffuse and then it starts to clump up a little bit into this bigger, bigger clump. And then at the end of the game, somebody is probably going to have a ton of money in front of them, like 30 or 35 uh, money, uh, but then almost no territory out on the board. And the question is, are they going to be okay? Like, are they actually going to win with not much territory, but a ton of uh, points in their money? Um, in our first game, the person who came in second had essentially zero map uh, uh, conquest, but they had so much money that they actually ended up being in second place, which was kind of peculiar and interesting and fun for me all around. I think that this game does some really neat ideas. Um, I really want to try this one at lower player counts though. Specifically, I think four might be a little bit better. Um, you actually play with less walls, so there is a uh, adjustment for that overall. But um, there is a bit of downtime, I suppose, in a five player game. Uh, it takes a while to come all the way back around to you, even though the turns themselves aren't that uh, slow overall. That's just a lot of people. Fortunately, things could happen like having your houses put out on the map before you actually take your first turn, uh, which is is definitely a really neat idea. 
So yeah, I am happy to have this game. Uh, this is technically the only game that I bought from Essen. Uh, I did not go to Essen, Germany this last year, but um, I had some uh, FOMO, uh, fear of missing out, and so I used the Cardboard Caravan through, I think, Board Game Geek to order this one specific game out of all of the rest of them. I don't know, for some reason, this one really called to me, and it was not necessarily cheap, so I am glad that I am enjoying it and finding it so peculiar, weird, and fun, considering I did spend a decent amount of money on it. Uh, so yeah, I am uh, planning on playing this one several more times. Um, each of my two five-player games came in at about an hour, maybe a little bit over that, so uh, when I think about potentially playing this with three or four players, that will be an even quicker overall game for a wacky experience, and uh, yeah, I think that's going to wrap up all my thoughts on that one. Well, let's now move on to the second game, and that one is Coloma. Now, this is a recently uh, published game. I'm not sure exactly when. Uh, it was funded through Kickstarter, and a friend of mine backed it on Kickstarter and brought their copy to Game Night this last week. Uh, they asked if people wanted to play it, and I said, yes, I do, for one specific silly reason, and that's because I knew that in the middle of the board on the table, there is a cardboard piece with magnets inside the cardboard and another piece of cardboard with magnets that kind of uh, stick together in a really cool dial sort of way. Um, I didn't really know anything else about the game beyond the fact that it had magnets in pieces of cardboard that stuck to the board, uh, but that was enough. Uh, so uh, we ended up playing a five-player game of this. It actually plays up to six, and normally we would be reticent to play a five-player game for the first time for everyone. However, this is a simultaneous decision-type game. Now, the way it works is on your turn, or I guess on everyone's turn at the same time, everyone's going to pick up this dial, and it has one, two, three, four, and five written on it with another piece of cardboard in front. Now you're going to set the cardboard to show just one number, and that is the location that you want to activate for that turn. Now in the middle of the table with the aforementioned uh, magnetic cardboard, uh, there is this wheel of five different action spaces. Now, once everybody has made their decision, you flip them over and you put your worker pioneer person onto the spot that you wanted to activate, and then you check to see if any one spot has more of those workers than any of the other five spots. If that's the case, then you take the little magnetic piece of cardboard and you flip it over to the area that had the most people, because that is a blocking tile. Now, on the actions in the middle of the table, there are two actions that you are going to be wanting to take, but that little top uh, magnet blocker is going to block one of those. So what that means is, if you decide to do the action that the, most of the people decide to do in that turn, then you will only get one of the two potential things that you could have done. So you are certainly incentivized to try and go and activate areas that you think other people won't go to, um, and of course everybody is simultaneously making this decision. Now when it comes to what you're actually doing with these actions, it's relatively uh, basic uh, tableau building stuff, but Basic actually sounds kind of negative. I don't mean that. It's, it's simple. That's a better word. Um, now, there are spots that just give you resources, like give you money, give you uh, gold that you can certainly use. Uh, there are other spots that let you play cards out from your hand into a tableau area. Now, a nice thing about this game is the fact that every single card in your hand has the same exact cost. Um, that simplifies things, but they all do different things. And um, the uh, I guess every card has two costs, technically. Again, the uh, action spots have two potential areas, and there's a different cost for each if you spend gold or money, but I'm trying not to go into the specifics too much. So when you go to that spot, you play these cards out, and now in the future, whenever you activate that specific one out of the five actions, if that action matches the number of the card that you just put in your tableau, you get the extra activations of the stuff on that card. Um, the card that you played also will always give you, I believe it was six victory points, and obviously victory points are good. So what that means is you are um, trying to get resources, and then you're spending resources on other spots to build out cards in your tableau. Uh, there's another location where you can move a caravan on a map, and this map will give you access to a whole bunch of resources, primarily uh, little workers, uh, little pioneers that you can use for the last mechanic that I should probably mention, which is a shootout with outlaws. Now, the structure of this game is you're going to play through three overall years, and within each year, you're going to do five of these actions. So you're going to do 15 actions in the whole game. Now, at the end of each year, you have to check to see if there is, an, uh, if there is more of the player little pioneers on the outlaw spot than the actual outlaws. Now, outlaws are going to show up when people take these barrel tokens, which give them bonuses, and again, I'm not going into the specifics, but um, if you uh, collectively defeat the outlaws, then the person who helped the most is going to get a really big bonus, then second and third get stuff, and if somebody did nothing, they actually have one of their little people die, and that's going to be negative points. Now, if everyone collectively loses to the outlaws, well, the person who helped the most still gets stuff, and the person who helped the second most still gets stuff, but it's less, and then it's 
it's more punitive for the third, fourth, etc. people. So you are certainly trying to keep that in mind while you are trying to do all of these other things. And I was really impressed with this game. Uh, I wasn't super sure about it once uh, we finished the rules and started playing, but I really enjoyed the engine building aspect to this game when it came to putting those cards out in front of you. Uh, I believe everyone has the same exact deck of cards. I can't remember exactly how many cards it was. Actually, no, I think it was 16. But either way, there's a decent number of cards in that deck. And being able to add on extra actions to the actions that you're trying to do in the middle of the table can make these ultra actions. And the game has 15 moments, essentially, where you are, you know, inhaling and holding your breath as you put your person down, hoping that the majority of people don't go and activate the spot that you went to. Um, those are obviously fun. I really enjoy that idea. And the uh, overall execution worked really well. Uh, I think our five player game ended up taking about an hour and a half. And uh, if we played with six players, it probably would have taken about the same amount of time because in general, not only are you making these decisions simultaneously, but you can also perform the actions simultaneously. Uh, there's technically a first player and for a couple of the actions, um, going in order matters, but that's like 10% of the actions or 20% of the actions. So the vast majority of this game happens fully simultaneously as people are doing all of their own things. Um, now, there can be some serious combos that you can pull off, especially when you consider some of the bonuses that you have and some of the uh, barrels out on the board and whatnot. And one really cool thing that I love is the fact that some of the cards that you play out into your tableau give you a benefit if the action that you activate has the blocking symbol on it. So normally you would think, oh, blocking symbol, always bad. But no, not in Coloma. If you play out certain cards, you might want people to all go over there because you don't want the regular secondary action. You want that blocking symbol to activate the card that you have in front of you to actually do some other cool stuff. So the fact that the game turns its main penalty into a bonus for people, potentially anyway, is such a neat idea overall. Uh, so yeah, I am looking forward to playing this game more. I obviously don't have a copy of it in my collection, but a friend of mine does. Uh, I enjoy simultaneous action games. I enjoy uh, overall tableau building. I enjoy pretty much everything about this game. Uh, it's possible there are some things that I will grow to dislike if I play it some more, but as far as an initial impression is concerned with this first play, I uh, really enjoyed it. So uh, hopefully I will have many more opportunities to try this one in the future. All right, let's now move on to the third game I'll be discussing today, and that one is Sabotage. Now, I actually played this one right after I played Coloma at the same game night, interestingly enough. Um, now, this is a game that I backed on Kickstarter, and I've had my Kickstarter copy for months at this point. I don't remember exactly when it was shipped out to me. I don't know, maybe like five months ago or something like that, and I've been interested in trying it all along, but I finally was able to make that happen. Now, this is a fascinating game because it only plays exactly four players. I, I guess you can, I think, play two players against an app-driven AI, but I don't know the details of that. Now, in this game, two players are spies and two players are villains, and this is an asymmetric secret movement programming style game. So what happens is the spy players are trying to infiltrate the uh, villain's lair and they are trying to deactivate their doomsday machines. Uh, conversely, the villains over there are just trying to hurt the spies, trying to damage them enough times to get to their winning condition to slow the spies down so that their doomsday machine can go off and they're gonna win. Now, mechanically, the way this game works is the actual box for the game unfolds into this massive screen down the middle of the table that uh, kind of reminded me of Captain Sonar. And then on each side of the screen, there is an identical map of the layer. Now, this layer is not big. It's a four by four grid. And each person is going to put their own figure down onto the map wherever they are. And as you're playing through the game, you're going to be moving your figures around the map and also trying to use various abilities that you have to try and deduce where your opponents are. Um, so for the uh, villains, they are trying to use motion detectors to find the spies. And for the spies, we are doing scans that try to find the villains. Now, interestingly enough, the villains, when they motion detect, they can do it anywhere in their lair because obviously it's their lair. But as the spies, whenever you scan, you are going to essentially ask the villains, um, is anybody in the row, column, or quadrant that that spy is in? So obviously that gives information to the spy, but it also gives information to the villains because they know that that spy is in that row, column, or quadrant. Now, 
Uh, that asymmetry is really interesting overall, and it actually means that as the spies, it can be really tricky to move because the main way that you move in this game as a spy is you have to move and then you are forced to scan. So you are constantly trying to figure out how you can uh, outmaneuver your opponents mentally as they're trying to figure that out. And I say opponents because if you hadn't figured it out just yet, I played as the spies in this game. Uh, so the way the mechanically the rounds actually work is each of the players on both sides have this stack of different action tiles and you are going to program exactly what you want to do with these tiles. They might be move, they might be uh, thermo, they might be a hack, which is the main way that the spies uh, disable those doomsday machines. And you have to program all this out. And many, in fact, most of these actions require dice. Now, at the start of every round, uh, one player is going to roll all of their dice, and then every other player matches their dice to that. So you know exactly what the options are for your opponents and for your partner, and then you use those dice to activate the various actions. Now, interestingly enough, you can give uh, the opposing side these cheat sheets that show you everything that you can do. So as you're trying to figure out what you want to do on your turn, you're also looking over there and you're like, okay, you know, this roll, it was like a one, one, two, five. So I look over there and like, what can the opponents do? Or maybe it's one, one, two, three. Well, five is the main way that the villains can actually uh, hurt the spies, at least at the start of the game. So you're like, okay, I think we are safe. They can't activate their stun guns. We don't have to worry about them hitting us. So let's kind of move around with impunity and not worry about it and hope that we don't roll fives next round, except the way that the spies uh, win is by hacking those doomsday machines and the hack action also requires fives. Now, there is a little wrinkle to this in that the players start the game with a couple modify cubes and those can add one or subtract one to the dice that you activate. Now, interestingly enough, as you progress along with your victory condition, again, with the spies hacking doomsday machines and the villains damaging the spies, every time you move towards your victory condition, you give the opposing team another modify cube. So that means the better you are doing, the more ability the opponents have to actually modify their dice to get up to the things that they specifically need. So it's harder and harder to track exactly what they can do because you actually don't know if they're actually using those cubes. So in this game, we actually ended up winning as the spies and it was relatively close overall. Um, at the beginning, the, it was a little bit clunky, if I'm being honest. Uh, it was a first play for everyone. I had read the rules like one or two days prior and it probably took us like 45 minutes or maybe 50 minutes to actually get started. Not because there are so many rules, but because I was having a rough time actually teaching through all of these rules. Uh, the game itself actually flows quite smoothly once you understand it. Uh, the next time I play it, I will likely be able to teach the whole thing in like 15 or 20 minutes. But either way, as we started playing the game, we had a strange dry spell, actually, where for the first essentially four rolls, we didn't get anything over, I think, a three. And as I mentioned, the uh, uh, attacks for both players effectively activate on a five. So there was a lot of, like, posturing for the first few turns of the game, not really much happening as we're kind of going over here and going over there. And I'm not going to go into the specifics of it, but each side also has an asymmetric way to unlock new actions. So I think we were, uh, both sides were prioritizing on getting lots of unlocks to get new actions that would let us do a variety of other things. For instance, I got an action called tunneling, which let me move through uh, the walls. Now, an interesting part of the deduction of this game is um, from the perspective of the villains, well, I guess both players, but from the perspective of the villains, in this case, they were having trouble figuring out where I was because I was doing these illegal things. Uh, you know, I was, you know, seemingly over here and the next turn I was over there and they're like, how could they figure that out? And my opponents weren't dense. It took them about a turn to figure it out, but um, they had to look to the cheat sheet and be like, okay, it looks like John has tunneling because that is the only conceivable way that John could actually figure that out. Now, once they knew that, well, now they know what I can do and now I have to be, uh, play around that. But there was like a turn or two there where they didn't understand that I was tunneling and I got a pretty good advantage there. We got some hacks in on the doomsday machines. Um, now, I think part of the uh, miss on that for them and for everyone really was uh, feeling unfamiliar with the game because it has some funky ideas and uh, things that you're trying to think about as you're crunching all of this stuff. Uh, now, we actually seem to be getting into a really high lead as the spies. We got a lot of the uh, doomsday hacks in before we got damaged even once. But then at the very end of the game, uh, essentially the last round, there was a coin flip where our opponents, uh, the villains, uh, the way they programmed, they weren't sure where I was and they 
thought it was one thing, and then when the actual turn happened, they missed. And if they had hit, then that actually would have been enough to put us into sudden death, where either side would have won once they hit their condition one more time. So it seemed like we had a big lead, and sure, they uh, did need to get a couple more hits in when the game was over, but it was closer than it looked overall, and it seemed like everyone enjoyed it. Um, again, it was a little rough, and I apologize for that uh, because of the teach and the start overall, uh, but I'm looking forward to playing this one more because it's got some really neat ideas, and I think the play experience will be uh, more fun and smooth the next time because I fully understand how all of this stuff works. Um, the first time teaching it, it's like, okay, I understand, I understand this, but then you're like, okay, how do we unlock? The unlocking, unlocking is different for this and that, and there's just a lot of this and that kind of things, like going back to the rule book. The rule book was fine overall, I think. It's not very long, but it's got big pages full of text. So uh, yeah, this was a good initial impression. I'm glad I have the game. It's certainly an unusual gaming experience, and uh, for that reason alone, I'm hoping to play this one at least a few more times to see if my enjoyment of this one is because I actually like the game, or if it's just a novelty factor because the game does feel so different. All right, it's now time for the final game I'll be discussing today, and that one is Sorcerer City. Now, I want to start this off by saying that I did do a paid sponsored tutorial and playthrough for this game that went along with the Kickstarter campaign. Um, now, obviously, they did not pay me for this impressions, but they did ask me if I wanted a copy of the game to play and cover my impressions for, and I said, sure. So uh, take everything I'm saying with a grain of salt because I was paid to make content for this game, and I have uh, been paid by this publisher to do content for several of their games. But either way, I have played it once, and I Want to talk about my impressions, so keep all of that in mind. Now, the way this game works is every single round, each player is going to simultaneously and in real time build out a city with their tiles. So this is essentially a deck building, tile laying, real time game. Now at the start of the game, everybody has, I believe, an identical stack of tiles. And when you build out your city, you just put tiles adjacent to each other. They are all square. And um, you only have, I think it's about a minute. I can't remember exactly how much time it is, uh, but you don't have a ton of time to build this out. Now, at the start of the game, you have more than enough time. The, the deck is not that big, and you're trying to put these down so that you're matching colored regions into large different shapes, specifically so that those shapes match the goals on the tiles that you place. Now, uh, certain tiles don't have goals at all, and other ones have that little shield that is going to give you uh, the different resources in the game. Uh, sometimes you want a long, straight area of that specific color. Uh, other times you just want large amorphous areas that will give you a lot of the specific resource based off of what color that is. Now, um, at the uh, starting end of the game, you have more than enough time to actually build out your city. You don't have that many uh, tiles in your deck, so you can build this thing out, and then everyone will simultaneously score their city, and they will be picking up uh, various things like influence, magic, gold, and I believe, yeah, victory points, or I think it's called influence. Now, the game has this interesting thing where the magic is actually a wild resource. Once everyone has has scored their city, you then simultaneously select a card that tells everyone else what all of your magic is going to turn into, whether or not that is going to be the uh, influence, the gold, or the uh, victory points. Uh, so you have to figure out what people are going to do because the person with the most influence at the end of the round is going to get extra perks, and they will also get first shot at uh, buying some new tiles that they can put into their deck. So uh, that's going to be the flow of the round. You're going to be uh, building your city, then you're scoring your city, then you're uh, getting some bonuses and adding tiles. Uh, now, when you add tiles, you have to spend the gold that you have. So obviously, building out your city to get a lot of gold is a good idea. But uh, in addition to buying tiles into your deck, you also have to put monsters into your deck. Now, at the start of each game, you are going to randomly pull out a couple of uh, different monsters, uh, one for each one of the rounds that you're playing. And each monster does something different. Sometimes they actually kind of help things out, but they uh, vary the gameplay to a certain extents. Now, you randomly put that into your uh, overall deck. And as you get deeper and deeper into the game, that deck of tiles gets thicker and thicker, but the overall amount of time that you have to build out your city remains constant. So early game, it's easy to build your whole city, but late game, you might find yourself really going fast to get through all of these tiles. And then at the worst possible moment, you might pull out a monster that will force you to cover up a good tile for you or discard a couple tiles from the board and put it back into your deck or do a wide variety of things. Now, I say that as uh, a negative, but in the game that we played, we did have a monster that discarded tiles, and that actually 
really gave us a new uh, tactical thing to consider. Um, if we built things out that wasn't kind of working, you could place out that monster to discard a couple back into your deck and restart and uh, have another go at it. But of course, thinking about what tiles to take and how that's going to help you is going to take time, and time is very precious. Now, uh, I've only played this game with the final version once overall, and it was a three-player game. Uh, technically, this game plays up to six players, I believe, because uh, the vast majority of the game does happen simultaneous. Now, in our three-player game, we um, had essentially a complete blowout. <laughs> One of my friends uh, won by an enormous margin, and um, in our defense, this is my friend Nick, and he wins a lot of games. He wins more often than he really should. He's a smart guy. Uh, <laughs> great guy, too. Uh, but... Um, he felt a little bit weird near the end of the game because the deck that he was able to build and the city that he was able to create in front of him was just enormous uh, in its scoring potential. Uh, with the tracks that you score, you actually cap out at 60 for each of those things. And in the last round, and I think the second to last round, he was capping out a couple of these tracks, just getting an amazing amount of different resources, which really helped him catapult up into um, easily winning the game. Now, I easily lost the game. I came dead last, and I think that's because I did not make particularly good deck buying decisions, and I also think I had some uh, unfortunate luck with a couple of the rounds, especially late game. A couple rounds, I had several cards or tiles in my deck that I didn't get out because I ran out of time, and that's because like the, the specific monsters that kind of mess things up and caused me to act, think extra came out at really inopportune times. In addition to that, my opponents were both able to kill off several of their monsters from their decks. So their decks had less monsters, which means they had more tiles that were good for them compared to me, where I was just uh, muscling through mentally trying to figure out what I should do with these exact moments. And um, in a couple of those rounds, uh, some of the really high scoring uh, shields in my deck were down at the bottom of the deck and they didn't actually make it out onto the field. So uh, the overall experience, I think, was like maybe 45 or 50 minutes, so it wasn't very long, and I think in general I enjoyed it, and my opponents enjoyed it as well, but I don't think it necessarily blew any of us away. Uh, my friend who won, uh, Nick, um, while I say I think he enjoyed it, he also felt like what he was doing was was like crazy powerful and he didn't feel like he was playing the game that much better than the rest of us and he pointed out that the way he constructed his deck meant that he kind of built a very similar city each one of the rounds. Uh, he had gone really hard on, I think, a, a couple of the specific colors in the deck construction, and the way the scoring worked, he just found himself putting these tiles out and kind of building very similar combinations in that city. Obviously, he did not build the exact same city each time because you have to shuffle up your deck, but it felt to him like the different ways his cities uh, kind of uh, was created uh, did not feel all that different from one round to the next, especially near the end of the game. I think part of that is because uh, he and another one of my opponents was able to get rid of most of their monsters and those monsters can really be uh, a wrench in your plans to force you to do different things with your overall city and I think um, part of the reason I came dead last is because of well having so many monsters in my deck not taking care of them not trying to get rid of them and also just you know obviously having to deal with the ramifications of uh, what they did to my city so at this point I, I think I'd like to play this game again I don't think I am crazy excited to play it again because that experience that first experience anyway was a little bit strange <laughs> being completely blown out like that um, but I am intrigued by the overall ideas of it. I think it could be fun to play this with more players although you're going to need a very big table <laughs> as you are building out uh, all of these cities in front of you. So uh, for the moment it's uh, staying in my collection. I'm hoping to have more opportunities to give this one a try uh, even though the first play for all of us went fine but didn't necessarily blow our socks off. Well, at this point, we've reached the end of this impressions vlog. Uh, currently, I have discussed all of the new games that I've played, but uh, it's very likely that I'll have another impressions vlog coming out somewhat soon because I'm going to be in some opportunities to play a bunch of new games uh, relatively soon. So uh, definitely keep your eyes out for that. I'm not sure what games those are specifically going to be, but um, yeah, another impressions vlog is likely going to come out in the next week or so. So at this point, I think that's going to wrap up this vlog. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including all of these producer-level Patreon backers. If you too would like to directly support the channel and the creation of videos like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support to see a variety of ways with which you can do that. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button down below as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.